Hi, hello and welcome. My name is the Alpha Female and you're listening to Turnbuckle Talk. Whoa! G'day, Maddie's Bushwhacker Luke here. 2015 Hall of Famer. And you're listening to Turnbuckle Talk. Yeah! Whoa! This is pro wrestling's only modern day Viking gunner, and you're on Turnbuckle Talk. Hey, this is Nick Magnus Tolders, and you're listening to Turnbuckle Talk. Hi, this is Leva Blue Pants Bates, and you are listening to Turnbuckle Talk. Hey, this is Jeff Jarrett, the king of the mountain and founder of Global Force Wrestling, and you're listening to Turnbuckle Talk. Hey, fellas, uh, uh, you guys have a great day, and, and this is only because I'm talking to Canadians. It is actually spitting snow in Tennessee. See? Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> That's <We're> a great... <laughs> we've, had, we've had 70 degree weather here. For, I mean, we really had a warm December, and I get on the phone with damn Canadians, and we're spitting snow, so... My name is Carl Carafel. This past week, we lost two amazing performers in the world of professional wrestling. Tonight on Turnbuckle Talk, we are celebrating the legacies of Terry Funk and Bray Wyatt in the only fashion that we know how. We begin tonight's episode with a 10 bell salute. Thank you for joining us for that 10 bell salute in honor of these two great men that we will be talking about tonight. My name is Carl Carafel. I'm joined alongside Chris Best for tonight's episode. And we're going to be talking about the legacies of these two men. We're just waiting a brief moment because we know that OMD will be joining us as well tonight. And we're going to bring him on momentarily once he is set and ready. And Thank OMB you. is now with us. Thank you so much. Chris, how are you feeling right now? I really wish I could say uh, we were doing the show under better circumstances, but this past week has just been, it's been hell on my heart with everything that's happened. <clears throat> Definitely has been. OMD, how are you feeling? I'm doing well. Had a long physical day, but I mean, as Chris alluded to, the this past week has just been absolutely tragic and devastating in the world of wrestling. It definitely has been, and I want to make sure that these men get the proper that they deserve. As Ed pipes in and says, follow the buzzards. Rest in peace, Bray. Definitely. Yes. Uh, we we all followed the buzzards. Yes. We were all fans of Bray Wyatt. We were all fans of The Fiend. We were all fans of uh, everything that he did, whether it was in NXT, whether it was in uh, the main roster, whether it was with the Nexus, with FCW, with the Wyatt family. As the champion, the WWE champion, the deleter of worlds, the Firefly Funhouse segments, and the Fiend that he did, and then the final return that we did get to see. Very, very little bit of, but we did get to see that with the uh, the Wyatt Six, as they were calling things for a little while. We, I know we definitely have a lot to talk about with Bray Wyatt, and we're going to leave that for the second half of this segment. Before that, I want to talk about a man who um, almost revolutionized the world of hardcore professional wrestling, one Mr. Terry Funk, working with uh, Western State Sports Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, All Japan, the WWF, the WCW, International Wrestling Association of Japan, Eastern Championship Wrestling that turned into EC Dub. 
return to the World Wrestling Federation, Extreme Championship Wrestling, back to WCW, doing independence. The NWA TNA returns to the WWE as well as independent scene. The man did so freaking much in his career. And I think they alluded to, what was it, 50 years of work inside the ring. Man, what a testament. Right? So Terry Funk is his actual name, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, He was even working up until last year. Yeah. Even amid all his health issues with his liver, his kidneys, all of that. Right? He he didn't he didn't quit. He was one of those old school guys that just continued on no matter what. Hassan. Thank you so much for coming in. Appreciate you. If you have any memories of uh, Terry Funk or Bray Wyatt that you would like to share with us, please do in this chat, and we will make sure that those get put up on screen. Now, when we when we talk about Terry Funk, um, this is something that that I decided to do, and I put it out there to everybody in social media to uh, give us their memories. And I, I got I got three. Uh, three people that uh, that responded, but this is how we're going to do it tonight. So the first one for Terry Funk. Terry Funk may very well have been the greatest wrestler of all time solely for the reason that he elevated every single wrestler he worked with or wrestled with. And that comes to us from uh, Joe via Facebook. Um, I don't know. What do you what do you guys think? Do you, do you think... Uh, I, I agree with that. I a hundred percent. I do. I, I think 1000% agree with that. I, I brought it up last night about Terry. Um, if it weren't, and I said this, if it weren't for uh, his matches with the new age outlaws, when you tag team alongside cactus, Jack, the new age outlaws would not be where they are today. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I didn't really know a whole lot about Terry Funk's early career. Right. Um, I do remember him vaguely in ECW. I remember him more from his WCW. I remember him from WCW too, tag teaming with one bunkhouse buck. Mm. Yes. Yes. Um, But again, that was sort of WCW. And I was, I was probably more interested in the younger guys or even a DDP as opposed to watching Terry Funk. Now, when he came to the WWE as Chainsaw Charlie and he and Mick Foley brought him out and then they had their matches, they became a tag team. Right. And as Chris alluded to, pushing the New Age Outlaws to where they are. Um, And as we've all alluded to, his continuing to work this last year or two amid Mm -hmm. all of his health issues. Right. And whether it was in the ring or going to the conventions and signing an autograph. Oh yeah. Like him working those conventions was absolutely fantastic. And he did it very, very often. Yes. Hassan uh, does have something, uh, you know, to kind of give us here as well on Bray says, uh, yes, I do. He got COVID uh, and got a heart attack and it made me sad. So he's in the grave and passed away. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that is exactly what happened with Bray. Um, yeah. We are yeah. receiving those reports now that he yeah. did. Uh, it's have... confirmed his funeral is tomorrow. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. it is. For me, Terry Funk, um, I remember mostly from ECW. Uh, yeah. We're looking back in like the 1993 time and era back you know eastern championship wrestling into ecw um where you know 1997 terry funk actually became the ecw world heavyweight champion by taking that from raven at the barely legal pay-per-view that they had in 97 i have that pay-per-view on dvd because they uh, released that as a special edition with uh one night stay in 2006 i believe it was nice and you see, for me, that's that's like I loved that Raven was is a great person, great wrestler, everything. Right. But for me to see Terry Funk do that, I was just like, this is absolutely yeah. amazing right now. And and Terry Funk is one of the reasons why I embodied 
the character that yeah. I did when I was working in the wrestling ring as the extreme Canadian Carl Carafel, because Terry Funk was this Southern boy. He was an extreme Southern boy who did hardcore professional wrestling. And yeah. that's uh, kind of what I wanted to embody. And uh, I, I think I did for the most part. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, like that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So another thing I wanted to allude to my, it, it actually goes to my earliest memory of Terry Funk. And I always said my first show I've ever remembered watching wrestle was WrestleMania two. He was on that show, but I don't remember him, you know, being, a, I don't remember being a child and watching him then. Right. But, um, my first memory of him, uh, and this goes back to the comment that we put up before about how we put over younger guys, was mm-hmm. uh, the tag te- a tag team match he had. It was at a Clash of the Champions, the same Clash of Champions where the Butcher attacked Hulk Hogan before his title defense against Ric Flair that night. Okay. And uh, on that show, he teamed up with uh, Bunkhouse Buck to take on Dusty and Dustin Rhodes. And Dustin was in the middle of a fair size push at the time and terry put him over okay don't and dustin was still in his rookie years at that time interesting that's that's pretty cool omd do you have any other like memories of uh, of terry funk from maybe more recent days that you can remember uh from more recent days the probably the like even the earliest memory i have of him was coming out on WCW, when he had his major announcement, and he came out and announced it's a girl because he was about to become a grandfather for the second time around. Okay. okay. Um, but, I mean, to hear, you know, how much he epitomized hardcore being hardcore before ECW, before the New Jacks, before the Ravens, before the Sandmans. Right. And, you know, maybe he should have been labeled as the true innovator of violence. Maybe, maybe so. I, I, I definitely think that that moniker could definitely go for him. JJ, thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate you. We're going to get to your comment here in just a moment. Chris, you had something you want, you were going to say. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, uh, because you said innovator of violence and it's something clicked in me. And I remembered something Ric Flair had said in his book about Terry Funk. He said he always felt that, yes, they, while they worked hardcore matches and Terry beat the piss out of Flair a lot, he always felt safe working with uh, Terry as well. Hmm. That is the makings of a true professional wrestler, somebody who can go in there and uh, make you believe that they're kicking the ever-living crap out of somebody uh, just to make it look like that put on that show while still keeping kayfabe back then we we discussed kayfabe you know a couple weeks ago we discussed kayfabe um yeah he was a guy that that always continued to keep that omd you're going to be totally covered up by this comment just so that you're aware for a moment okay the voice joshua joseph comes in and says so chainsaw charlie was my first sighting of funk as a kid he scared the piss out of me but also excited my mind on hardcore wrestling so my older cousin troy said this is terry funk tame on the wwf back at the time the world wrestling federation he sat me down for a weekend and i watched terry funk in japan i watched the uh a c4 match C4 explosive match yeah. uh, and just a man who wanted to entertain. He was a solid soul for the business. Thank you, Terry Funk. You taught me it's okay to be insane. Wow. Beautifully said. Beautifully written. So we do have another viewer listener comment for Terry, Terry Funk. This one says Terry Funk versus Cactus Jack. All the matches with them, uh, they made you believe, uh, you know, and we would not have the hardcore scene like we did if it were not for these two guys and what they put out for us. That's coming to us from a dawn via Facebook. So, yeah, like 
hundred percent agree there as well. Mick right? said that himself in the book as well. <laughs> in his book. Yeah, definitely. If it wasn't for them, I don't know that we would have hardcore like we have. Right? Mm-hmm. In in okay, I'm gonna say in mainstream. Right. 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 There's still there was always companies that were doing insane shit, doing crazy things, doing this hardcore style. But these two, I think, really pulled it all together to be able to to make it hardcore, but still keep it mainstream. And then especially when they had their times in the WWF or the WWE, whatever you want to call it, you know, working together. Chainsaw Charlie definitely 100 percent was a character that was just absolutely insane, but made it work and made it relevant enough to be on television. Yep. Yeah. And I got to say, the last hardcore match I watched Terry Funk wrestle was the tag team hardcore match where he, uh, Tommy Dreamer, and Bela McK- McGillicuddy took on Mick Foley, Lita, and Edge at One Night Stand 2006. Right. And I had so much concern for Terry, but little did I know was he was actually fine and he was just really selling really well in that match. Right. Right. Yep. <laughs> Again, again, coming back to that kayfabe that we talked about earlier, um, he, he was a guy that legitimately kept that. JJ saying, uh, remember Billy's eyes? Anytime they did a big spot with those two, they got oh, yeah. so big. Yeah, they were saucers. Yep. Yeah. They were like teacup saucers. 100% they were. Terry Funk, thank you so much for being the man that you were. For allowing us to uh, have a little bit of your life with us. And all of this stuff is still out there for people to be able to, uh, you know, take a look at and see. But the man didn't just do professional wrestling. The man actually went out and did movies. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Starting back in 1989 in the movie Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. How many people... In the wrestling no, business. No, 87. He did a movie with us, Stallone. Yes, he oh, did. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> I can't remember the yes. name of the movie. <laughs> Me either right now. But I remember 89. Yep. That much I remember. Roadhouse, the big bar fight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, how many people can say that they've worked with Patrick Swayze? Right. In That are in the wrestling business, right? Yeah. I was actually thinking about this the other day, too, uh, because... I noticed in uh, watching No Holds Barred, Stan Hansen's character was a lot like how Terry Funk was in Roadhouse. If Stan Hansen couldn't do that role, I would have picked Terry Funk for sure. Right? Yeah. Over the top. That's right. And then let's even go back further then. Um, 1978 with Paradise Alley. He was in that movie as well. Once again, with, uh, with Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, him and Stallone were really tight friends. He was also very good friends with uh, Bruce Willis as well. Yes. Yes. And then he did another movie called The Ringer back in 2005. So going from 1978 to 2005, that's what I'm seeing right now. I don't remember Terry being in that movie. I've seen that movie quite a few times. Uh, Cameo. There were cameos by Terry Funk and Jesse Ventura. I'm going to have to go back and watch it again. And then there was an autobiography released in 2005. In 2010, he appeared on Right After Wrestling with Arda Ocal on Sirius uh, Satellite Radio. I, I remember listening to that show. Right? <laughs> Me too. And then he's in video game format as well. Working yes. as himself and as a downloadable character as Chainsaw Charlie for oh. WWE 13. Yes, I, yes. I, I, I remember, remember when I remember when I got that DLC pack and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to play as Chainsaw. <laughs> right. I, I remember, you know, doing the BCN fantasy wrestling and beating the my character, beating the snot out of Terry Funk <laughs> in a backstage brawl. <laughs> Granted, it was a three on one handicap. Yeah, okay. I've actually I've actually got a little known story about Terry Funk that I don't think a lot of people would have known, but for oh. the the ninety six yeah it was the ninety six Royal Rumble, Dory Funk Jr. made an appearance in that one. 
it wasn't supposed to be Dory. It was supposed to be Terry. Oh, really? Yep. Oh. But Terry, uh, Terry backed out because he had a movie commitment with Bruce Willis, a movie that ultimately didn't end up getting made. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, you know what, JJ? I agree. JJ is saying Roadhouse is enough for Terry Funk to give him a star on the walk of fame. I I think so. I think so. Yeah, he was one of the guys in the bars. And then uh, watching the special games, JJ says. Yeah, that's the ringer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Terry, for everything that you did do for us, for everything that you gave to us, allowed us to see, allowed us to live through. Everything was absolutely fantastic. A decorated champion uh, member, uh, you know, holding the Iron Mike uh, Mazurki Award in 2005 with the Cauliflower Alley Club Championships with uh, Championship Wrestling from Florida, All Japan, ECW. Um, class of 2010 for the... Uh, uh, George Tragos Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame, 2005 class for the Hardcore Hall of Fame, 2021 class for the International Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame, doing so much stuff with uh, Juggalo Championship Wrestling being their champion once, NWA Hollywood, Big Time, Propane, lots of rankings in PWI, so many, so many different things here in the class of 2009 for the WWE Hall of Fame as well. Yeah, if there's one regret I have when it comes to Terry, I remember, I was thinking about this earlier today, but I remember about 20 years ago, they had a big wrestling show at the casino across the river from where we live. And I remember Terry Funk was actually supposed to be on that card taking on Two Cold Scorpio, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, Really? I don't remember that. No. <clears throat> I think it was at the Bay Mills Casino, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> okay. 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 I never found yeah. out anything about what was going on at Bay Mills. Everything for no. me was always at Kuwaitin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Carl and I did the Legends show at Kuwaitin. We did. But but Terry was not there. <laughs> Juggalo Championship Wrestling, old drunk Terry Funk. He set Cactus's sack on fire and didn't give a shit. Violent J commentary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Ah, absolutely fantastic. That's what we've got for Terry Funk tonight. We're going to take our time and we're going to move over to Bray Wyatt because I know that there's a lot on Bray that is out there. And I've got a few different things here for uh, Bray Wyatt from other people. And the first one that we're going to share is just simply rest in peace, Terry. Rest in peace, Bray. That coming to us from Sean the Butcher with Sirius XM's Liquid Metal. Um, thank you, Sean the Butcher, for the inclusion here with this. Absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. Uh, amazing guy over there. If you are, if you're not following him, follow at Sean, the butcher, just as it was written there. So Chris, let's start with you. Give me, give me something that you remember most vividly about Bray. His overall presence, just the way he always carried himself. Like he, he always looked like he was bigger than God. And that's what I loved about him coming to the ring. Every time he came to the ring, I would sit here, complete silence, just soaking him in, soaking in his character, everything he did, listening to every single word he had when he cut a promo. Right. OMD. <clears throat> Again, the same as Chris, just watching, listening, captivated. I remember the first time I saw the Wyatt family on NXT. And I was thinking, what is this? Like, because I had no idea. And 
At the time, I mean, I wasn't impressed. I believe that was a Harper and Rowan match. Um, but the way they were able to go all in their separate directions and come back and the Wyatt family hadn't changed. Right. Right. That was absolutely amazing. For me, my biggest takeaway was Bray Wyatt. And that's something that I think I'm going to uh, remember for the rest of my days on this earth is his ability to connect through any character that he chose to be. Yeah, because even, even as Husky Harris, I was still enthralled with watching him wrestle. Granted, he was yeah. very vanilla with that character. Right. I remember my first the first time I saw him wrestling as Husky Harris, and I'm like, he's going places, this guy. Right? And that's that's exactly, you know, kind of what all of that was. Uh, Husky yeah. Harris, that character was that professional wrestler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was just your generic, you know, player one pro wrestler. That's what that was. Yeah. And he was able to captivate with that to the point that we remembered who he was when he came as Bray Wyatt afterwards. Yeah. And I'm not going to just... lie when he made the debut on the main roster and you hear the crowd chanting Husky Harris, that did annoy me a little bit. Right. But right. that that's uh, that's a huge testament though to his ability to mm-hmm let you know that this was the same person, but different Mm -hmm. at the same time. And people knew who Husky Harris was. Yeah. He managed to shut them out pretty quickly too. Yes, Yes, he did. (laughs) Yes, he did. JJ is saying, what's the meaning of his messages? He has a message hidden and joked. No one has found it. What the F is that? Or what the F is it? I don't know. And that's no. that's how Bray captivated you. Absolutely. Right? Kept you guessing. Absolutely. He was the one guy probably in the entire industry that never needed to have a title and could still keep you wanting more. Yeah. Yeah. I said it last night during the uh, Thunderdome era. Him doing the fi- the Firefly Funhouse, every- him coming out every week, that was the shining light for what was a shitty situation for the entire world. That was my shining light watching Bray Wyatt every week. Yeah, definitely. Definitely it was. We yes. we had that because it was it was very much so a um, darker atmosphere inside the arena, right? There's nobody there. There's no need for all the house lights to be on just the, you know, the light in the ring with the screens around, but then you come to this vignette and it's like, Ooh, bright in my face, pop of color. You know, we're getting that, you know, cheeky kind of uh, Bray Wyatt coming through. And then, you know, very reminiscent of a Jake the Snake Roberts. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Right? Right. One of my favorites. I love Jake. Yes. I, I love him. If Jake wasn't involved, forever. If Jake wasn't involved in AEW, I would have loved to have seen something between him and Bray on WWE TV. Right. 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 Even if it was just a uh, you know, like a like a managerial type of aspect like he has been doing in AEW. Uh, I thought it was, but I don't think that he even needed that though. Bray didn't no, need that. Bray didn't need that. What I would have liked to see, you wouldn't have even needed physicality, but just that confrontation, that face to face. I mean, what about how you, Chris, cool it, how, yeah. how cool would it have been? Let's say Wyatt didn't pass and we still had the Wyatt six gimmick coming up. How cool would it have been if Jake did come in, not necessarily as a manager, but just like as a, a corner man for them and just, you know what I mean? Like a ma- the mastermind, if you will. Right. Yeah. Like Jake could have just stood out at ringside and every once in a while you see, you know, somebody from the family go over and Jake just whispers something and then they go back into the ring. Like that connection alone, just that would have been yeah, so sick and twisted and awesome. Yeah, definitely. It would have been, 
We've got another message here from a friend, Don, via Facebook, saying Bray Wyatt uh, was when he first showed up with the Wyatt family. I'll never forget that moment. Showing up with the Wyatt family definitely was huge. Huge. Not just because of the men and their stature, which was huge. But just this, we, we got another faction. Right, and it was a something different from what we've seen before yes. because we've seen the NWO, we've seen DX, we've seen the Four Horsemen, we've seen all these other little factions that are out there, but this was like a dark, brooding type of, uh, you know, this faction. was more, of yeah, a, even uh, even darker uh, than the Ministry, right? Darker than the Ministry, yeah. yeah. Chris, what did you say? I didn't catch that. It was more of a cult as opposed to a faction because like Hmm. him, Harper, Rowan, and even Braun had the entire crowd. Even Daniel Bryan, when he was there, when he was a part of them as well, had the entire crowd eating out of their hands every time they came out. Yes. And Randy as well. That's right. I forgot Randy was a part Um, of them for a brief time. And that was, that was. That was cool, by the way. That was one of the most epic storylines for both Randy and Bray. Right. And you know who really benefited out of that too? It wasn't just Randy and Bray, but Luke Harper benefited quite nicely out of that. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Definitely did. Uh, I think when, every, all of them, all of them that mm-hmm. were part of that that faction, part of, you know, the Wyatt family, they yes. all really benefited from that, whether it was Luke Harper, uh, you know, Rest as well, uh, you know, Eric Redbeard, who we have, uh, we've seen locally here, uh, yeah, which was fantastic to get to, to you know talk with him for a couple of minutes as well. Like all of them, really shone afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yes, and to be honest, like up until Eric at the time, Eric Rowan had really gone out on his own when Bray had been released. Brody had gone to AEW. And then Rowan, you could actually see the work. He was able to change up his gear from that jumpsuit. And that's when... (laughs) Yeah, no, after the Bludgeon Brothers, when he went solo, even with the stupid cage, but, you know, when he was able to do his squash matches and actually show that he could work, you know, and then seeing him here live locally... uh, but yes, it's. And the one who benefited the greatest, I think, out of all them was Braun Strowman, because he was super frigging green when he came in as a member yes. of the Wyatt family. Yep. Oh, And yes. I remember, I remember, I hate to use his name, but Meltzer had said that WWE had planned to put the title on Braun by the end of the year. And when, when he had said that, Braun was super green and I'm like no it ain't gonna happen but by the time that year rolled around I wanted to see Braun with the title right yeah. <laughs> see, <laughs> see I I never did um, I always found where everybody complained in that time about how much they were shoving Roman Reigns down our throat mm-hmm. I found the exact same thing for Braun Strowman and I just I, was, I found myself looking forward to Braun <laughs> no I still don't look forward to Braun. <laughs> well, they can't all be winners coming yeah. from the family, I guess. There's always got to be that black sheep of the family. Yep. He was the black sheep. So. Um, <laughs> right. But, but I want to, um, I do want to extend some kudos. If the reports in the story is true of Roman not being on SmackDown because he flew to Bray's home to deliver JoJo the blue universal title and retire it officially. Yeah. And that, I mean, we're going to have to wait until SmackDown uh, this coming Friday to really find out 100% for sure, I hope. Um, I hope that that is the case. I hope that that is what well, Roman did. I mean, it was uh, it was Bray that Roman took the, that title from. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I think I think it would definitely be fitting for that to happen. 
Um, we it's it is still speculatory. We don't know if that has actually happened yet or not. But if it did, like you said, OMB, huge kudos to uh, you know Roman for for doing that. Uh, when yeah. he, I mean, he didn't have to. He could just you know, no, no, and did or whatever, and to do it out of the public eye, right, mm-hmm. right. That's huge for me as well. They didn't have to make this big spectacle of it. It just was done. If it was done, it was if just it was done. done. Yeah, right. See, we we don't even know. We don't even know. That's how out of the public eye it is because we don't even know if it did. Nobody happen. really knows if that actually happened. <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. But I'm sure we will find out. Yes. Joe via Facebook says Bray hearkened back to a time when wrestlers really embodied a character. He was a once in a lifetime kind of performer and he will be missed. Yes, I definitely agree with that. And that's um, going back to, uh, you know, my first initial thoughts, uh, you know, when we came to the Bray Wyatt portion of this, this show tonight is that he was able to embody any character that he that he had that he was playing at the time whether it was the husky harris whether it was the eater of worlds whether it was the fiend it didn't matter whatever character he had he lived that character and embodied all of it yeah absolutely and i know like we've all heard it before from Numerous reports, you know, how much they compared Bray Wyatt to the Robert De Niro character in Cape Fear or Dan Spivey as Waylon Mercy. Yeah, right. And another character I absolutely loved. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Waylon Mercy with that, that like, dagger, like, that was supposed to be tattooed on his forehead. Like, oh, like that. It just, just. Yeah, gripped you. Yeah, like, I, re- I need to be afraid of this guy, yeah. but I'm loving this guy right now. <laughs> right? I remember uh, you brought up Dan Spivey, <laughs> and I just remembered something about this. When Bray Wyatt started that uh, the the Cape Fear character, Bray, uh, Eater World, he called Dan Spivey to get the okay on the character. And Dan Spivey said, yes, do it. Yes. Okay. Bray Wyatt laid it all out, how he was going to do the character, and Dan's like, you got it. Do it. Yep, I, I did. I did hear that as well. This one's a little bit of a longer one, but this is from our friend Jordan via Facebook. Again, he says the nightmare, the horror, the eater of worlds, the fiend. Bray Wyatt's cryptic character always gave you the feeling of dread knowing he was coming. Or even not knowing when. It saves or it gave a more terrifying feel to what others have tried to do. Still, the best thing he did when coming to the ring was the Bray Lantern that was so eerily cool to see. And I was not able to get a picture of that that I that I felt was okay enough for because uh, I did all of those graphics up for us tonight yeah. uh, of the when the mask was on the lantern because that was absolutely fantastic as well. Yes. Oh, but yeah. just the lantern itself. Yes. And to this day, after seeing everything that Bray did with that, I still, if I have a lantern around somewhere, I'm grabbing that thing and I'm, yep. I don't care. Here. I don't care. I uh, have <laughs> since then and I always will now. I'm going to remember this. When I went to Columbus for my first concert festival in 2014 and I went solo, I arrived in Columbus, I got to the hotel, and my Facebook status was, Columbus, I'm here. Blows out electric lantern. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Um, And, you know, to realize Bray's family and the legacy his family has left, going back as far as, I mean, probably even further back than the horsemen to the original blackjacks. You know, how he didn't try to carry on the rotunda legacy. Right. right? And they didn't try and push 
Bo Dallas and Bray Wyatt as actual brothers, as actual family. But right. they also didn't, you know, okay, Bray Wyatt's going to face Bo Dallas here tonight. And then they're going to spoil it by saying, well, they're brothers. They let him be who he is, not yeah. having to be a second or third generation superstar. Right. And that's uh, and that's why Mike Rotunda came back to the WWE in 91 as IRS as well. He wanted to carve his own niche in the wrestling business as, and not be uh, Blackjack Mulligan or Blackjack Wyndham's uh, second coming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of great things that we could continue to say about Bray, but I think we're going to leave it at that. We would also be remiss if we did not mention this man as well, a man who had a, uh, a lot to do, even winning one of the WWE Slammy Awards, who also recently passed away at the age of 99, Bob Barker. Rest in peace, Bob Barker. Probably the best host of Monday Night Raw to ever have been on the program. Thank you, Bob Barker, for everything that you did for the world of professional wrestling and the entertainment that you understood and gave to us. I was debating on whether or not to do this, but I think we will do it anyways. Chris, we do still want to make sure that everybody knows where they can find you and what you have coming up and what you do with our <laughs> local establishment. Uh, sorry, I'm just laughing at that comment JJ just said about Bob Barker. <laughs> Daytime pimp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he definitely was. He, re he really was. He had a lot of, there was a lot of controversies around uh, how he was a womanizer. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah. All-time greatest uh, game show host, in my opinion. Nobody Absolutely. would be. Absolutely. Him and Alex Trebek and Pat Sajak are my three favorites. So, Understandable. Yeah. But no, if you want to find me on my socials, you can find me on YouTube at ChrisDamage83, Twitch TV, uh, CBRS underscore entertainment. Find me on threads at CBestFilms83 or on Facebook at Chris.Best83. Uh, you can also find me here Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, alongside Carl, alongside OMD, and alongside Chris Parrish for the Monday Night Raw Watch Along. OMD. They can find me on Facebook at Daniel Horisic. They can find me on Snapchat, One Man Dynamic, capitals on OMD, OMD, and now on Twitch at OMD17. And coming up this week, I will be hosting the Boar's Nest this coming Thursday with Bubba Duke. And we will be playing in honor of Bray, in honor of Terry and Chainsaw Charlie, we will be playing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Nice. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, We're I, not going to talk. Oh. I actually had one more thought about Bray. And this is yeah. something that I was thinking about with him as the fiend character i'm a huge fan of slasher flicks and horror movies so anytime the fiend came out i i marked out for what he was going to do because i always cheered for the killers in the horror movies you know right right <laughs> and what would have happened had we been able to get a movie featuring a bray wyatt or a fiend oh, character I so i wanted wwe studios to do that with him and not just i mean as fantastic and as gripping as that Wyatt Swamp match was against Braun. <laughs> you know, take that. Yeah. You know, I know that was a cinematic masterpiece, one of the best cinematic matches I've ever seen. Just don't say that to Papa Smokes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. But get something like that or one of those types of characters. Mm -hmm. in and you know let that movie in 
That's right. <laughs> you can find me and all of my socials at my link tree, L I N K T R dot E E slash Carl Carafel. That's L I N K T R dot E E slash K A R L K A R U F E L. If you're ever looking to support what we do here with Turnbuckle Talk and Turnbuckle Studios, the link tree does have a PayPal that you can donate to if you so feel fit. I will let you know that all of the donations that go in there do come right back into the programs, into uh, the creation of the graphics that are done for us and, and all of these different things. It does go back and help pay for all of that. There are so many different places that you can find our local establishment. Please find whichever way you can for the majority of things. It's our local establishment. Go and check all of them out. You will not be disappointed. There's so much great content that is not just professional wrestling based, but we have got, gaming we've got movies we've got music we've got paranormal we've got so many different things that are over there for you to check out my name is carl carafel i've been graciously joined by chris best and omd for this episode that we have entitled celebrating the legacies remember everyone the world's a scary place. Take care of each other. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands.